already. So seem to be having problems with the overhead projector too. So let's just see if I can get that working. This is what happens when you're in a, a new room. Sorry about this guys, just give me a couple minutes to get my slides up. So we're, we're recording, which is an improvement. And I just need to not have a blank screen in front of me here. I'm just going to hop onto the Blackboard site and download the slides because this computer is doing all sorts of interesting things over here. Thanks for bearing with me. It's a little bit ridiculous. Alright guys, we're recording and we have slides. This is progress. <laughs> Alright, can I just say thank you for coming. That I had images of me, empty room, and I'm really impressed that you're here. Um, I'm really pleased that you're here too because it's a really important lecture in terms of where this sits in the course and where it sits in terms of um, end of semester exams and things like that. So good on you for making it. Um, and uh, hopefully everything records the way we need it to for people listening at home. So um, I've got a couple of slides on my video link here that I can't put up on the desktop. But the first one is, of course, the assignment. So uh, you would have seen the new discussion board has been created for the assignment. And um, I'm just reminding people to post their questions um, to the discussion board on uh, the Blackboard site for each of the courses and I'll be responding to them um, um, sort of at intervals across, across next week. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing I just wanted to mention 
um, and I've said it to a few groups, but when you're crafting your report, your, your planning assessment report, they call it a supporting report in the ECP, but it's your planning assessment report. And if you're wondering what you should be using in terms of the um, you know, table of contents and how many words in each section, if you're sort of trying to picture in your mind what your report should look like, just remember that the answer to that is contained in the four corners of the planning scheme. So if the planning scheme is concerned about it or is imposing a requirement on you, you put that in your report. If the planning scheme isn't mentioning it, then you don't need to start thinking about things outside of the, the planning scheme. It, this isn't one of those assignments where there's a trick, you know, to trip you up or anything like that. The idea is you are assessed on consistency with the planning scheme and, and that's the way um, that you'll do well in the assignment. So just that's just sort of a commonly asked question that's come up across the course of the week. Now, I wanted to show you um, something in the media that happened just in the last few days, but I'll, I'll just stick to the slides that are working at the moment. Um, uh, so you won't, you won't be able to see that, um, but I'll post something later about it. But it's the, the Abbott Point water spill. Hopefully you've sort of seen it in the media, the, the um, coal-coloured water that was leaching from the um, Abbott Point um, coal terminal into the wetlands adjacent to it. And um, one of the th first questions that came up when this plume was identified on the satellite imagery was, is this lawful or unlawful? And it all comes back to the, the issues and the components of the Environmental Protection Act that we're going to be looking at today in terms of what is environmental harm, when is it lawful and when is it unlawful. Now in this case with the Abbott Point water spill, um, as it turned out when they contacted the Department of Environment, the Department of Environment said, well, it's an authorised release. And so they had applied for a temporary emissions licence that allowed them to release that water into the adjacent wetland because of Cyclone Debbie, because of the, the sheer amount of water coming through. Now, that part of it is not unusual, that you know, these coal mines have to let the water go somewhere. What is interesting is that the Department of Environment said, but that temporary emission, uh, emission licence does not allow them to release the water in such a way as would cause environmental harm. And we'll talk today about what that means, and there's going to be further investigations um, against the, the coal operators in terms of water testing and so on to see whether they released within the limits of their temporary emissions license, but also did they do so in a way that then caused harm to the, to the um, surrounding wetlands. So it's an interesting application of what we're going to be doing today in terms of our case studies. Our case study that we're, we're going to use for looking at the legislation is about as, you know, ordinary as they come. This is like bread and butter stuff. Um, when I was at the Roads and Traffic Authority, this was very common, very, very common. So what happened? They decided to lay the bitumen when they knew rain was coming. It happens all the time. Uh, but unfortunately, if you do that, then the bitumen runs off the road before it's had time to set. And in this case, it had uh, headed for the nearby creek. So um, here's the uh, Townsville bitumen primer spill. So there we are in Annandale up in Townsville, North Queensland. And um, you can see it's, it's close to the bay there. So we're giving you an idea of the creek location and also its um, proximity to the, the bay. And then you can just sort of see it's, it's fairly um, developed, it's sort of residential housing and um, it, it all happened at the corner of that road there and we'll have a look in a minute. You can see there's two circles on this slide. So A is where it all occurred and B up the top is where the creek was. So it, it ran from the incident at down into impacting on um, the, the creek. This is where it all began, corner of Glendale Drive and Hazelwood Crescent in Townsville. Uh, they were resurfacing this area of road 
and um, when the driver arrived with the bitumen, um, he queried to the um, the constructors, you know, whether or not they should be laying it, given that there was heavy rain on the way. Um, nobody then went and checked the radar. They didn't check the rain, the rain, the radar to see what was coming. They laid the bitumen and then they left the site. Again, very sort of common <laughs> um, practice that you would try and obviously educate a company not to be doing. And then the heavy rain came, which you know up in North Queensland, when it rains, it, it rains. And it just, we had runoff. So this is um, the uh, photos of the day. You can see the area that where the bitumen was being laid. Um, you can see there it's on the corner block and that, that black shiny residue there, that's where the bitumen had run off down the road. So these photos are taken after the incident. So EPA is notified and they go out to investigate. And you can see that's what they see is this, this shiny uh, residue running down the road and in, into the nearby creek. Someone's dropped their hat there just to give you a scale in terms of showing the width of the amount of um, uh, material that would have run off that site. And there, there's the stormwater drain. So it's gone into the stormwater drain. What's missing from around that stormwater drain? Anything at all, really. Anything that might have acted as a sediment control barrier. So there's been nothing put around what would consider to be like a risk point on the site would be where are our nearest stormwater drains and what do we do to protect them. And normally you'd expect to see some sort of sediment control barrier, some sort of bunding, something that in the event of uh, sediment heading for those stormwater drains, there's something there to... Um, to rectify that before it goes down into the stormwater and of course from the stormwater drains it's going to head to the nearest creek. So these are more images of the site. Um, this is where it all ended up and you can see the those white patches there where they tried to toss in absorbency um, materials to try and soak up the contaminants. Um, so that part of it was a good idea. Uh, but you can see the thick black sludge um, around the place from where it's made its way down, down to that area. There's some more images of it. Um, this is them putting uh, control barriers in the creek now to stop it making its way downstream. Um, and there you are, you can see... Um, we're talking about very high quality occupational health and safety here. Uh, can you notice protective footwear? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, just shorts and, and no shoes and they, they're going into the contaminated creek to toss the um, sediment controls and to try and contain, try and contain the runoff um, until it's treated. So let's look at the Environment Protection Act. Let's see what offence, if any, has the company committed. So this is the Environmental Protection Act. Uh, you find it in the usual way. So you go to the Queensland um, State Government website. You look up um, the current Environmental Protection Act, just like you did with the Sustainable Planning Act. You would have remembered this slide from a few weeks ago the toolbox that the Department of Environment has in terms of um, dealing with environmental harm in this case. Just keep this, this in mind as we go through and we look at some different examples of the types of tools that the department has. So I want to focus on sort of three broad areas. Um, looking at duties and obligations under the Act, that's a tool in itself. The second tool is looking at how they manage environmentally relevant activities and the EIS process that goes with that. And then the third type of tool is um, enforcing compliance with conditions of approval. So we'll look at those in turn. So again, you should remember, because I've mentioned this a few times, what's the object of the Act? Well, the object of the Act is to promote ecologically sustainable development. That's the, the, the purpose of the Environmental Protection Act is to protect Queensland's environment while allowing for development. Um, and so that's your overall overriding 
um, purpose of the Environmental Protection Act. And then remember there's also an overriding duty of decision makers. So if a function or power is conferred on a person, then they must perform that function or exercise the power in a way that best achieves the objects of the act. Okay, so um, again, that in itself is part of the, the uh, a tool that can be used in terms of um, making sure that um, in ecologically sustainable development is more likely to occur. How do they achieve the objects of the act? Well, they do it by setting out four phases. The first is they want to establish the state of the environment. Okay, so that's phase one. That means they're going to research into what the current state of the environment is in Queensland in order to know um, where the significant impacts are. And we've had a, a one issued very recently, um, a state of the environment report. The second thing they're going to do is look at developing effective environmental strategies. The next thing, phase three, they want to implement those strategies and they want to integrate them into efficient resource management. So that's your approvals processes. And then phase four is ensuring accountability of environmental strategies. That's really where third parties come in. You know, we've talked a lot about community participation and the importance of third party litigation. That's part of your phase four. It's part of the design of the, um, of the act is that you accountability is ensured um, in terms of allowing those third party um, processes. So here it says phase four is to be achieved by reviewing the results of human activities on the environment, evaluating the efficiency and effectiveness of environmental strategies and reporting publicly on the state of the environment. And that's what we, we get. We get our regular state of the environment reports. Um, Section 6 talks about community consultation or community involvement in the administration of the Act. It says this Act is to be administered as far as practical in consultation with and having regard to the views and interests of industry, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, um, interested groups and persons in the community generally. Um, very wide definition of environment is included under the Environmental Protection Act. Um, so we talk about ecosystems and their constituent parts. It includes people, it includes communities, it includes natural and physical resources, um, qualities and characteristics of locations, places and areas that contribute to their biological diversity and integrity intrinsic or attributed scientific value or interest, amenity, harmony, and sense of community. Um, and it refers to the social, economic, aesthetic, and cultural conditions that affect all those things mentioned above. So you can see there's a real flow there from just you know, the objects of the environment to that broader sense of interaction with it, um, you know, and, the, and the way that it impacts on us socially, economically, aesthetically, and culturally. How do they narrow that down in terms of how the Act operates? Well, they do it by talking about um, environmental values and they do it by then going on to talk about what is unlawful environmental harm because clearly you, you can't have such a broad definition of environment um, and, then, and then not somehow place limits on that. So they do that, first of all, by talking about this concept of environmental value. They describe it as a quality or physical characteristic of the environment that is conducive to ecological health or public amenity or safety or another quality of the environment identified and declared to be an environmental value under what they refer to as environmental protection policies or EPPs. So what's environmental harm? Now remember, we have environmental harm and then we'll ask ourselves what is unlawful environmental harm? But environmental harm in itself is any adverse effect or potential adverse effect whether temporary or permanent, and of whatever magnitude, duration, or frequency, on an environmental value. So that's why we need our definition of environmental value. Environmental harm may be caused by an activity, whether the harm is a direct or indirect result of the activity, and whether the harm results from the activity alone or from the combined effects of the activity and other activities or factors. So you can't use the fact that it is, you know, like, if you like, a cumulative impact, you know, everyone, all the resource operators together creating this harm can't be used as an excuse for none of them being held responsible for the environmental harm. 
Um, and that's particularly important when we think about greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so on the, on the face of it, the Environmental Protection Act um, with, can be used to um, prosecute environmental harm from greenhouse gas emissions because they can't use the fact that it's indirect or the fact that it results from the combined effects of the activity along with other activities. That can't be used as an excuse um, for, for non-liability. Um, however, the, the Queensland um, government chooses not to uh, use the Environmental Protection Act to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a decision that they've made. So the prosecutions that come from these, these um, offence provisions, it depends on whether it is serious environmental harm or whether it is um, um, environmental nuisance or material environmental harm. So serious environmental harm, uh, it says a person must not willfully and unlawfully cause serious environmental harm. Uh, maximum penalty, 4,165 penalty units or five years imprisonment. Um, and a person must not unlawfully cause serious environmental harm. So if it's willful, it's going to have a higher penalty attached to it and it will have an imprisonment term potentially attached to it. If it's not willful, it's just unlawful, then we're just going to see a penalty attached to it but no risk of imprisonment. Now, it's, it's only been in, in fairly recent times that we've seen the risk of a prison term attached to environmental offences. For a long time, it wasn't really considered appropriate to have these white-collar workers, as they sort of refer to them, um, facing prison time for errors made that led to environmental harm. That was all just considered to be a bit, a bit unpleasant and, and not really in keeping with the general you know, attitude that should be taken to industry and so on. Um, so it's actually quite recent, and of course it also means we very rarely see um, prison terms being, being um, applied to environmental harm, um, perhaps more so interstate in New South Wales and Victoria, uh, but certainly in Queensland it's, it tends to be very much a last resort. So what's willful, just for those who aren't sure, that has a legal definition, a legal meaning. It's got to be intentionally or recklessly or with gross negligence. Okay, so, so that's where the willful component comes in. So if they allow something to run out of their property, down into the drain, without, without any regard for the fact that that might cause harm, that would be considered to be either intentional or reckless or with gross negligence. Okay, so that would be willful. So we then have our definitions of what is serious environmental harm. So serious environmental harm is irreversible or of a high impact or widespread caused to an area of high conservation value. Um, and then they also put a, a dollar figure on it, but just notice it's or. So when we're interpreting documents, you want to look, is it an and or an or? So in this case, it's an or. So it's either irreversible or an area of high conservation value or causes actual or potential loss or damage to a property of an amount of more than 50,000 or results in costs to remediate and, and um, rehabilitate the area of more than 50,000, okay? Um, material environmental harm, um, again, we're looking at penalties there, 4,500 penalty units or five years imprisonment, and then 1,665 penalty units if they do it and it's not willful, yep. Um, okay, so I'll go back, but that's a good question. Thank you. So what I'm pointing, what I'm doing, I'm doing two things in today's lecture. So I'm talking about the Environmental Protection Act, but I'm also beginning to teach you about interpreting documents because you'll need to uh, learn that skill for the exam, and we'll do it in the practice too. But one of the things is just look at this slide. Okay, so... Um, sorry, I've got two computers going, so I just have to make sure. There we go. Um... When you're reading legislation, it can sometimes say and. Now, if it says and, that means you need to meet all of the things that are listed for it to fall under that definition. If it says or, you only need to fall under one of them. 
So in this case, when we're looking at serious environmental harm, it only has to trigger one of those to be considered serious environmental harm. It doesn't have to meet all of them. Yep, that's okay. So material environmental harm, something that's not trivial or negligible in nature, extent or context, and that, that is a, a really sort of important point to make, is um, when they wrote the water pollution offences in New South Wales, now New South Wales is a lot more stringent than Queensland, but when, when they wrote it, they wrote it with such a broad scope of pollution and such a broad scope of harm that when the lawyers interpreted it, they realised that just allowing a drop of water to fall into the ocean was in breach of the Water Act. It was considered pollution and it was unlawful. Um, and while I was in Sydney um, practising under that law, they, they hadn't amended it, so they didn't change it. Uh, but what you would then start arguing is this idea it's trivial or it's negligible. So yes, it breaches the Act, but it's so trivial that this is not something that requires um, prosecution. So in Queensland, um, well, obviously we don't have that problem um, where these things, are they're much um, lighter in terms of the prosecutions. Um, but they do point out that material environmental harm is something that is not trivial. It's not ne negligible in nature, extent or context. And then the figure amounts that they put on it are more than $5,000 or less than, but less than 50,000. Or results in costs for rehabilitation and remediation of more than 5,000 but less than 50,000. Okay, so if you're trying to work out whether something is material environmental harm or serious environmental harm, you're going to be looking at those dollar amounts and saying, well, if it, if it looks like it's caused about five to $50,000 worth of harm or damage or cost in remediation, well, then it's material environmental harm. If it looks like it's, it's done more than 50,000, well, then it's going to be serious environmental harm. Environmental nuisance is a separate thing, and this is, comes from our common law. So we've always had a common law um, um, protection of nuisance. So if somebody else causes a nuisance to your property, under property law principles and common law principles, you can sue them in court for nuisance. So this has really come across from our common law, that this um, definition of environmental nuisance. So it's the unreasonable interference or likely interference with an environmental value caused by aerosols, fumes, light, noise, odour, particles of smoke and so on, um, or an unhealthy, offensive on, on, or unsightly condition because of contamination. We'll talk about contamination more next week or anything else set out in the uh, regulations. And then the offence provision is that you must not willfully and unlawfully cause an environmental nuisance. Um, and you'll notice there's no imprisonment term uh, attached to that offence provision. So it's a penalty of 1,665 units uh, for willful nuisance and then it's 600 penalty units there for um, just straight unlawful environmental nuisance. So they're lower penalties. It's considered to be a less serious offence. Um, then it doesn't apply to an environmental nuisance that has protection under Schedule 1 of the Environmental Protection Act. And when we talk in a minute, you'll see what unlawful means. So all these things can be authorised by licences under the Environmental Protection Act. So if you hold a licence or if you hold an authority for it, uh, then you can't be prosecuted for it. So has an offence been committed? And if so, what should happen next? So, has an offence been committed? Yeah, I mean, they have the evidence there. Uh, quite often the difficulty in these cases is not, has an offence been committed, but do they have uh, the evidence they need to prosecute? Um, it, but in this case, you can see um, they've, they've got knowledge of the offence, they've got the people on site quickly enough to gather that evidence. So we say yes to that, and then we say, well, what should happen next? So I just want to talk about what should happen in terms of really when the contractor became aware on site that this was happening. And you've heard me mention a few times about the fact that the need for prompt attention and a prompt response in terms of uh, um, being... Um, cooperative 
with the Environmental Protection Agency. So the legislation has a duty to notify of any environmental harm. So if a person is carrying out an activity and they become aware that they've caused um, serious or material environmental harm, or that someone else has done it either through that act or omission, so either by doing something deliberately or failing to do anything to avoid it, um, if they're an employee, they've got 24 hours after becoming aware of the event to notify their employer um, they have to notify them of the event, its nature and the circumstances in which it happened. And if the employer cannot be contacted, they have, then have to give written notice to the Department of Environment. Now, that didn't used to be in there at all then, so that is an improvement. But you will notice those are quite long time frames, even 24 hours. If you're, if you're having a discharge of contaminant, into a creek, for example, let's just assume that it's not self-limiting, that it's, this is an ongoing discharge into the creek. Um, they, they've, they've got 24 hours to notify their employer, and if that doesn't happen, they have to put something in writing to the department. Um, fa failure to comply with the duty without reasonable excuse, so 100 penalty units there. So they're tr trying to put a bit of sting in the tail. So this is for employees. These are the contractors out on site, you know, they're not particularly highly paid, but an obligation is put on their shoulders to say, you must notify. Um, and uh, the employer then has 24 hours to notify the department, and they should also give written notice to the occupier or the registered owner of the land as soon as reasonably practicable. Um, so that's, that's sort of uh, important. If you've got your slides in front of you, Asterisks on this slide, this is the sort of thing you'd be asked in the exam in terms of duties to notify. So who else has a duty to notify? Well, if you're not an employee and you're not an agent um, and you're just someone else who's independent, you must notify them within 24 hours and as soon as reasonably practicable, give written uh, notice to the owner or the occupier of the land. Um, and they've now very, very recently, like uh, in the last few months, introduced an obligation for auditors. So third party auditors who are going on site to review a site, if they identify that serious or material harm is either happening or is threatened by the acts or omissions on the site, they now have an obligation to notify within 24 hours because they realize there was a gap because these auditors are not employees and they're not agents either. They're independent third parties. And so they, they weren't being compelled to notify the department um, of the fact that they had identified this environmental harm occurring. Um, and it, there's also a new obligation for local governments to notify the department as well. And uh, given how much construction is taking place and particularly roadworks from local government levels, you can, you can see why that needs to be in there. So what are the available defences um, to a, um, a, an allegation of environmental harm? Well, you want to ask yourself, when are these acts not unlawful? And you're going to look to section 493A. So in relation to any of the following acts, either an act that causes serious or material environmental harm or environmental nuisance, or something that contravenes a noise standard, or a deposit of a contaminant release of stormwater runoff and so on and so forth. These are when acts are not unlawful. So where it's authorised to be done. So if it's authorised under either an EPP, which I referred to you before, an environmental protection policy, um, transitional environmental program, an environmental protection order, an environmental authority. So that's the main one that you would often see. So if it's a, if the environmental authority allows them to release into um, uh, the creeks and so on, well then that is something that is lawful. Um, it could also be in a development condition of a development approval um, or it could be an emergency direction. So if we look at the example from the beginning of the uh, lecture today with the Abbott Point, um, if they had been directed to release their water into the wetland, for example, um, then that would be considered to be authorised and it would not be unlawful. To put it another way, it would be lawful. It would be lawful pollution. 
if they did it in response to an emergency direction or condition of approval or uh, any of those things on that screen. So the trick in terms of how the Queensland legislation works, and it's very similar in the other states, is you want your environmental authority to cover all those different releases of contaminants, for example, so that there's then no question about whether or not um, what you're doing is unlawful. Um, you also need to know about this thing called the general environmental duty. Again, you need this for the exam. So it's a defence to prove that the relevant act was done while carrying out an activity that is lawful and that the defendant complied with the general environmental duty. Okay, so you're carrying out an activity that's lawful, let's say you're a coal mine, and, and then whenever this thing happens, uh, you comply with the general environmental duty. So what is the general environmental duty? Well, a person must not carry out any activity that causes or is likely to cause environmental harm unless the person takes, and this is, this is the critical part, all reasonable and practicable measures to prevent or minimise the harm. So if they can show under Section 319 of the EP Act that they have taken all reasonable and practicable measures to prevent or minimise the harm, then they will have a defence to... Um, any allegations against them of unlawful environmental harm. How do you show that you've complied with the general environmental duty? Well, there's a few, there's a few things, and they're set out in section 493. And uh, you can see I've referred you there to 493A, subsections four and five. So for example, they might have an environmental risk management plan for their operations. Um, now, the whole point of an environmental risk management plan is to identify likely or reasonably foreseeable um, incidents and to put in place a management system for reducing that risk or for having in place a response if these incidents occur. So if there's an accredited environmental risk management plan and the defendant complied with the environmental risk management plan, then that would consider to be compliance with the general environmental duty. Um, if there was an industry code of practice um, for the particular act and the defendant complied with the industry code of practice. Again, something like that would be taken into account in considering uh, whether the defendant complied with their general environmental duty. So in considering what meets that, that definition of all reasonable and practicable measures, um, the act gives a list of the sort of things that will be taken into account, so the nature of the harm or the potential harm, the sensitivity of the receiving environment, the current state of technical knowledge for the activity, um, the likelihood of um, success in applying different responses, and particularly you can see they take into account the financial implications of the different measures for responding to that risk of harm and responding to the sensitivity of the receiving environment. Yep. So, in terms of this particular list, it wouldn't be in the code of practice, but they might be able to show that there was a site management plan that talked about the sensitivity of the nearby creek and, you know, the different potential for harm and how they were going to respond to that. You know, for example, we will put in place funding and we will put in place other mitigation measures to minimise the risk of the stormwater running down into the creek, for example. But the, the reason this list is there is the nature of the harm could be something very minor. It could be something incredibly serious. And so what is reasonable and practicable in each situation will change depending on what the nature of the harm was that was caused by the act and you know, current state of technical knowledge for the activity. Um, so was there something in place that could have been easily implemented in a cost-effective way that could have prevented that harm from occurring, okay? And I'll, I'll show you some examples as we go through in terms of like low-cost measures. So what would this look like in today's case study? It would look a little bit like this. We see a silt fence uh, which would stop 
this stockpile of soil from running off the site in heavy rain into the adjacent creek. Okay? Um, it's almost a no-brainer, except for the number of times I drive past construction sites and shake my head at the fact that this isn't in place. <laughs> I have a, a major construction site around the corner from me at the moment, and I feel like shaking my fist out the window at them every time I go past as I see this browny water running down the street and into the stormwater drain with no bunging in place. <laughs> and I'm like, hang on a minute. <laughs> this is like standard procedure and you're not following it. So, again, this is another example of what would be reasonable and practicable in, in today's case study. What they should have had is these, these sediment um, bunds in place that would have prevented um, the majority of the sediment from making its way into the stormwater system. And this is a, another slightly more um, advanced example where they're using the natural, the natural materials in the area, if you like, to try and... Um, filter that water before it hits the creek. And again, this is a more, uh, again, it's slightly more sophisticated example. So um, you'll often notice in the conditions of approval for building um, new houses and things like that, they often talk about the fact that these stockpile, stockpiles of soil need to be stored in a way where they're not going to overflow and um, and run off into the nearby creeks because it is happening so frequently that the council uh, is putting those those uh, conditions in place as well. So a few years ago, I had a a chat with someone from the Department of Environment, and they they had a program in place at the time um, to respond to erosion and sediment control problems, um, and and these were the slides that. Um, Amar Mir very kindly gave to me at the time. And it's really to try and explain to people why sediment is a problem. Um, and so it points out sediment is a contaminant. Um, and it's an offence to deposit a prescribed contaminant into the water. Um, it's a major problem in South East Queensland and it's an offence to breach your condition of development approval by allowing this material uh, to run off into the, the stormwater. Um, and they pointed out that the control measures that are being used on site need improvement. Now, how do they respond? They're going to respond with education, with encouragement, and with enforcement when they need to. So they had guidelines in place to try and encourage industry to improve its, its um, control measures. They had site visits, um, and again, this idea of verbally uh, warning them and giving them an opportunity to improve the practices on the site. So they have like a tiered system, and this is how they described it at the time. So first they get a warning for minor problems, then they will get a penalty infringement notice for a more serious breach, and they would move then on to environmental protection orders, which is a, a direct order to, um, to change practices on the site, to change emitting behaviours. Um, and remember, if you act in a... If you um, are in compliance with your environmental protection order, that in itself... Is a, is a defense to allegations against you of um, unlawful environmental harm. So that was one of the things in that list that we looked at in terms of the different authorizations that you could have. The other really important tool is uh, managing environmentally relevant activities. So um, approving them and managing them with conditions of approval rather than just allowing free choice in terms of industry going out and carrying out their activities with no, no pre-approval and no assessment. Um, so this is another tool for managing environmental harm. This is coming out of the Environmental Protection Regulation, um, which is a regulation made under the Environmental Protection Act, and you'll find it on the same Queensland legislation website. So envi an environmentally relevant activity is something listed in the regulations in Schedule 2. So there's a long list of different activities and what volumes or quantities they need to be in order to trigger being an environmentally relevant activity. So chemical manufacturing, oil refining, electricity generation, metal forming, motor vehicle workshops. You remember there was that prosecution um, back in the third, the third lecture for the planning series. We looked at that.
business that was prosecuted, and one of the grounds was that they were operating a motor vehicle workshop, um, which was an environmentally relevant activity, and they weren't holding an approval for it. Uh, but it, it covers a long list of things, beverage production, meat processing, uh, tanning, concrete batching, timber milling, boat maintenance, road tunnel ventilation stacks, and waste disposal and storage and water treatment are just some of the examples. There's lots and lots and lots of them in the schedule. Um, but these are all environmentally relevant because they're considered to have the potential to cause environmental harm. And so that's why they're coming in for approval. So this is just one example, bulk material handling. Um, so loading or unloading minerals at a rate of 100 tonnes or more a day or stock piling more than 50,000 tonnes of more or uh, loading or unloading at a rate of 100 tonnes or more and so on and so forth. So um, one of the reasons I put it up is um, it's one of those things that if it's done by a third party and not by the coal mine, then that third party needs to hold an environmentally relevant activity. Um, is, is carrying out an environmentally relevant activity and needs their own approval. Um, if it's covered under the environmental authority um, that the coal mine owns, then they don't need a separate approval to do the, um, the bulk material handling. And this again all relates back to the Abbott's Point where they need to transport the coal from the mine across to the Abbott's Point terminal. And so this is what you see. You see it transported like this. Um, that's very common. Um, there's, there's a real move to try and get these loads covered now as they, as they run through um, the cities and so on, the towns. Um, but then when they get there, you know, it's large stockpiles that are then processed onto the various transport. Um, and so um, there's real potential there in terms of um, air particles and, you know, the health impacts uh, in terms of nearby residents. What else is an environmentally relevant activity? Well, due to fairly recent changes, there's this new thing known as an agricultural environmentally relevant activity. And this is all about protecting the Great Barrier Reef. We talked about the runoff into the Great Barrier Reef that's been caused by fertilizers and um, other chemical use on these um, farms. And so they're introducing these environmentally relevant activities for commercial sugar growing, growing or cattle grazing where it's more than 2,000 hectares, uh, where it falls within these priority catchments, so the wet tropics, the Macquarie Wood Sunday or the Burdekin dry tropics. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So there's been a report uh, issued just in, in the last uh, month, and this is about looking to try and enhance the way that we deal with these runoff uh, into the Great Barrier Reef. And it's, it sort of points out that the strong scientific evidence that significant quantities of fertilizer, pesticides, and sediment um, are entering the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon. And then they go on to talk about the fact that they're going to look at different options uh, for how to regulate those areas. Um, and, and this paper just goes through the different, the different options that are on the table for that. Um, so the sort of three areas that they were looking at in this paper, one is to uh, set or improve minimum practice standards, target, targeting nutrient and sediment pollution. The second one is to set pollution load limits for each reef catchment area. And then the third one is to provide a broader framework dealing with water quality offsets um, to counter residual nutrient or sediment pollution. Um, so these were the sort of things that the paper was looking at. Um, in terms of seeing how the regulatory response could be changed to improve outcomes there. So you would have seen um, slides before where I've talked about environmentally relevant activities. Uh, there are three different types of applications, a standard, a variation, or a site-specific. A standard one means you're going to meet all the standard conditions of approval associated with the environmentally relevant activity. So it's usually low risk activities, low risk of environmental harm, not publicly notified, generally speaking, unless it's a mining lease. Uh, variation of applications are where um, it's, it's um, still reasonably low risk, but the applicant can't meet all of the conditions of approval that are in the standard conditions. So they're, 
they are applying to have some of those conditions varied at the same time as they're being approved. And then the third one is your site-specific application. So it's something where it's either so novel that there's no standard conditions of approval, or it's something that um, they just can't meet those standard conditions of approval. So they're asking for the whole project to be assessed, it's publicly notified, um, and then they'll get their own custom set of conditions of approval at the end. Uh, stages of assessment process, you've got your application, your information, your notification stage, and then your decision stage. Um, as we pointed out, when they're considering uh, whether it's an environmentally relevant activity and whether to approve it, they should technically be furthering the objects of the Act. Um, when they assess the application, so this is the criteria for a standard application, um, then they have to consider a number of things. And what I've, what I've done today is I've gone through and highlighted the bits that you particularly need to pay attention to. So it's just a little bit of drawing your mind to the sections that you need to um, be really considering when you're looking at these slides and, and applying them. So in deciding the application, they must. Okay, so that's a word you should be focusing on. Does it say must or does it say may? Okay, in this case, it says they must. Um, have regard to the application, the standard conditions and the standard criteria. And we've talked about the importance of you having a copy of the standard criteria. That's something that you'll need for the exam. What is the standard criteria? Well, it, it's a broad range of things, but it, it includes those principles of environmental policy that we talked about in week one. So the precautionary principle, intergenerational equity, and so on. Um, they also need to refer to any relevant environmental impact assessment. They need to refer to the character, the resilience, and the values of the receiving environment. Any submissions that are made are also considered to be part of the standard criteria. Um, and best practice environmental management is also something that should be taken into account. So if what is being proposed is going to result in really serious impacts on the character, resilience and values of the receiving environment and is not in accordance with best practice environmental management, then that standard criteria would mean that it should be less likely that it is going to be approved. So that's, that's the way the criteria is meant to be taken into account. You'll notice though that I've highlighted H on the second slide. They have to take into account the financial implications of any requirements that they're seeking to impose. Um, that's, that's part of the decision-making framework. They also need to consider the public interest. Um, um, and we've, we, what we've seen in recent years is that the public interest includes things like greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Um, and so if it's not dealt with anywhere else, as a general rule, it will fall under public interest. Uh, they have to take into account any site management plan, any integrated environmental management system, and so on. So there are EIS provisions that apply under the Environmental Protection Act. Just a note, that doesn't apply to coordinated projects. So if they haven't been pulled out of the operation of the Environmental Protection Act through one of the other pieces of legislation, then they're going to have to comply with the EIS requirements under the Environmental Protection Act. So um, it can be voluntary or it can be required as part of the application process. Um, they submit draft terms of reference. Those are publicly notified. So the public can make comments on whether, in fact, the EIS is going to cover all of the likely environmental impacts that need to be considered. Um, the chief executive then determines whether the EIS may proceed. The actual draft EIS that's written goes on public exhibition and the applicant or the proponent has an obligation to adequately respond to those submissions and make any appropriate amendments to the EIS. So they're required to turn their mind to each application, each submission, and show how they've taken it on board and considered it. So all of that's documented um, in, in the documents that are sent back to the chief executive. So then the chief executive prepares the EIS assessment report, 
has to consider the EIS, any submissions and the standard criteria, which is what we just talked about. It includes ESD, ecologically sustainable development, and it includes the public interest. And of course, I'm just pointing out, remember, that means that that power conferred on them to assess the EIS is meant to be exercised in such a way as to further the objects of the Act. So it should include protection of um, Queensland's environment and achievement of ESD. That's the way the Act was designed to operate. So if they decide to approve, obviously there's going to be conditions of approval. It's one of the most important tools that we see here in Queensland in terms of um, mitigating um, the risk of environmental harm. So generally speaking, um, the legislation tells us they may only impose a condition if they consider it necessary or desirable or it relates to um, uh, the carrying out of the prescribed ERA and so on. So um, in the example of the Abbott Point one I was talking about this morning, their conditions of approval allowed them to release certain amounts of water with a certain amount of sediment in it. Um, that was like normal, but it was very low levels. When they went back during Cyclone Debbie and asked for a temporary emission license, they asked the EPA to increase the amount of um, sediment or particle matter that was permitted in to be admitted under the license, so that they increased that to then, I think it was about 100 um, milligrams or something like that. I can't quite remember the numbers. Um, and so uh, something like that, um, it's a condition of approval. So the condition says, yes, you can release this contaminated water into the wetlands, for example, but there's a cap on the level of particulate matter that's allowed in the water that's released. And so that's how environmental harm is managed. The other way they do it is by saying, well, where it can be released and at what point in time and what water monitoring obligations are also attached to it to make sure that it's not causing unnecessary environmental harm and so on. All of that relies on sufficient monitoring, of course, from the department to see whether or not it's being complied with. So other things that conditions that can be imposed, again, I've highlighted a few things for you. So they can have things like environmental offset conditions. They can have conditions that relate to access to land to carry out remediation, for example, or rehabilitation. Um, or action to prevent environmental harm. Uh, certain activities will have to actually put all this into a plan, so a plan of operations. Talks about the actions and programs to achieve compliance with the conditions of an environmental authority. And this is really for the, the bigger projects. How are you going to organize your project so that you comply with this long list of conditions of, that are required to be complied with? Um, so, for example, mining and petroleum activities would have to have a plan of operation and it's got to be submitted prior to carrying out the mining activities and it's then an offence not to comply with the plan of operations that you've submitted to the regulator. Um, things that that plan of operations have to include, uh, where the activities will be carried out, what action programme is going to be put in place and there needs to be a rehabilitation programme put in place as well and that has to state a proposed amount of financial assurance um, for the environmental authority. So that will either be a bond or a payment that the department holds to cover, uh, to cover the miner not carrying out the rehabilitation. Okay, so it's a surety, a financial assurance that the department holds that they can then call on if they need to go and remediate or rehabilitate because the coal mine or whoever it is, petroleum operator, has failed to do so themselves. Um, and so that then means if the company goes into liquidation, the idea is rather than the Department of Environment having to go remediate and then try and recover their costs along with everyone else who's trying to seek recovery from an insolvent company, they get the money out front. The issue that we see is that um, quite often these companies, um, so quite often these companies need um, significant amounts of money, um, and they're looking for investors and they're looking for um, 
uh, funding for the project. And then on top of that is this large lump sum that the Department of Environment wants to hold as a surety. And that's often used as a negotiating aspect of saying, well, look, actually, we can't supply that to you because if we do, our, our project won't get funded. And so it's, a, it's used as a bit of a negotiating tool. Um, it's unlawful to fail to comply with a condition of an environmental authority. So if you willfully contravene a condition of authority, then you can face five years imprisonment. And if you um, just contravene it, you're looking at 4,500 penalty units. What's a penalty unit? It used to be a set figure. Now they um, have it subject to indexation every year, but it's about $110. So it's around about $110 per penalty unit. So the interesting part becomes when you start saying who is responsible for ensuring these conditions are complied with. So um, the person who holds the environmental authority, the applicant, they have to ensure that everybody, absolutely everybody acting under that environmental authority complies with the conditions of the authority. So that is uh, every person on site, every person in the coal mine, every person on the building or construction site, whatever the case may be, every person in the factory, um, they must all comply with that, the conditions of the authority. And if they fail to do so, then not only will they be liable for uh, prosecution, but each time they prosecute someone else, the holder of the environmental authority is also taken to have committed the same offence. So it's really meant to put quite a significant pressure on whoever applies for the environmental authority to um, to make sure that they apply for it. Sorry, guys. There we go. Um, there we go. So it's a defence to prove subsection four that the holder issued appropriate instructions and used all reasonable precautions to ensure compliance with the conditions. Um, that the offence was committed, we seeing see there's an and there, not an or. So it says the holder issued appropriate instructions and used all reasonable precautions and the, no the offence was committed without the holder's knowledge and the holder could not, uh, by the exercise of reasonable diligence, have stopped the commission of the offence. And this was one of the things that I used to um, do a lot of work in when um, I was working in my law firm in Sydney because uh, what they would do is the chief executive of these very large petroleum companies uh, would need to prove that they had made sure that every single person acting under their environmental authority was aware of their obligations under the Act and the conditions of the authority and the fact that they couldn't go and cause it environmental harm and their duties to notify of harm, all these things. And so they would outsource that to their lawyers and we would come in and we would just go from group to group to group giving a, a due diligence um, training session where we would explain to them about all these things they couldn't do on site and what was environmental harm and what was unlawful. And we'd often start with like the very senior executives of the firm who all sitting there in their suits and sipping coffee and by the end of the day it would be everyone rocking up in their um, you know high visibility wear and their boots and covered in mud and whatever and we would give a modified obviously version of the presentation to them so we would have covered all the different um, employees working at the company and that was one way that the company was trying to show to the regulator because in New South Wales you really do get worried if the EPA comes knocking you really do, because they have, um, they have imposed prison terms for chief executives who have caused environmental harm. So they do get quite nervous in, uh, in New South Wales about that sort of thing. But it's one of the ways you can say, well, yes, reasonable steps were taken to educate everyone um, about what was going on. So if a corporation commits an offence against the Environmental Protection Act, each of the executive officers is taken to have committed an offence. So even if they weren't out, you know, on the site at the time, 
They're taken to have committed an offence unless they can fall under one of the defence provisions. Okay, so if they were in a position to influence the conduct of the corporation and they can show that they took all reasonable steps to ensure the corporation complied with the provision, then that's a defence. Yep. Yep. So this is Queensland that we're looking at now. So the legislation that we're looking at on the screen is Queensland. Yeah. The difference is the anecdote I just told you was that they were scared of the EPA. That's New South Wales. In Queensland, if the EPA comes knocking, for example, the first, the first response would probably be just to pick up the phone, have a chat with them and say, oh, are you really sure? <laughs> Are you really sure you want to prosecute? So it's, there's less intimidation between, in, between the EPA and industry. It's much more of a cooperative kind of um, let's negotiate, let's have a voluntary improvement here. Um, but, but what we're looking at up on the slide, that's Queensland legislation. So in writing, it's, it's equally strict. It's just, it's just about that discretion that... that um, exists in the government as to whether or not they go ahead with prosecutions. So this slide's important. You will need to know the slide for the exam. So there's two defences. You can see there's an or there between the first and the second dot point. So they can either fall under one defence or under the second defence. So the first one is that, yes, they were in a position to influence the conduct of the corporation. Um, and the officer took all reasonable steps to ensure the corporation complied with the provision. Okay, so the sort of example I just talked about um, where we used to go out and do these training sessions through all the different tiers of the company, that, for example, would be considered one part of taking all reasonable steps. The second defence is if the officer can say that they were not in a position to influence the conduct of the corporation in relation to the offence. So those are the two, the two defences there. What are reasonable steps? Now, it's going to depend on the circumstances, but it can include having suitable environmental management plans and incident response plans in place, having appropriate staff training, supervision, reporting procedures, um, having ongoing audits of environmental systems, that's quite important, um, and showing compliance of industry standards and so on. So you've got a handout there um, that called due diligence make sure you have a look at that and make sure it comes into the exam with you. Um, we have these changes that have been brought into effect. They're, they're very fondly known as the Clive Palmer Amendments uh, because they were enacted as a direct result of um, his particular behaviour. And what has happened now, this was, this, these were passed in April last year um, but they're very much the talk of the town because the uh, Department of Environment has just released the guidelines that go with the new provisions. And that, I think everyone had thought that the guidelines might narrow the scope of these provisions, but in fact the guidelines have made it very clear that they are really still very broad. So what they've done is they've, they've done two things. One is these amendments are retrospective. Now, retrospective means they apply backwards in time. Okay, so it's, it's something that, from a legal point of view, we don't do too often because there's a question of, of fairness and justice about imposing a legal obligation that someone didn't know about and then just going backwards in time and applying it. So they're retrospective. So they apply to anything that's been approved in Queensland. And what they do is they extend liability to parent companies and anyone who falls under their very, very broad definition of a related person. Okay, they're not part of the executive officer liability that I just talked about. This is separate. This is a cost recovery mechanism. Okay, so if a company goes into liquidation, leaving behind a tale of woe, you know, a, a site that is heavily contaminated and will require millions of dollars to clean up, where does the government go for reimbursement? Well, usually they could only go to the company 
And if the company is insolvent, then they can't get the money back. And this cheesed off the Queensland government so much that they decided to enact these changes, which allow them to then pursue related persons to get them to either carry out the remediation themselves or to recover the cost of doing so. So it's, it's like an, an environmental protection order is then imposed on a related party. Now this party could be entirely foreign to Australia. It could be a wholly um, China-owned company that deliberately created an Australian entity to protect itself from any sort of issues like this, which is so common. This is the way business tends to be set up is so that you can minimise your risk using shareholder companies. So it's caused a real stir uh, because um, they're talking about it being in breach of free trade agreements, for example, uh, all sorts of things. It's, you know, very interesting. But for your purposes, what you need to know is that um, these guidelines have come out and that they're saying that a related person can be, it can be any parent companies, it can be uh, landowners. So if the entity, not the farmer, we're not, we're not going after farmers and things like that, but if the person who owns the land is another corporate entity that has had a hands-off approach to the project and has said, well, no, I'm not related to it, the government is saying, well, yes, actually, if you financially benefit from this project, then you'll take it to be a related person. So they have, they, it can be a parent company, a landowner, um, but it, it can be, particularly, it's number four that has got everyone worried. So if they have a relevant connection, if they have a relevant connection with the company, and there's two, two subsections to that, one is they have, that the person is capable of significantly benefiting financially from the carrying out of the activity, or two, uh, the person has, at any time during the previous two years, been in a position to influence the company's conduct um, then those two considerations are taken into account and if it meets either of those then they can be taken to be a, um, a, a related person and then an environmental protection order can be made against them. So that's been a really big change. Yeah, sorry. Uh, just a Potentially it could. Potent potentially it could be shareholders, yes. And um, the, and potentially it could be farmers who are on the land. Um, and so there's been that's been one of the big question marks is, well, how far will they go? And what I think what these guidelines show us is they're after the deep pockets, and that probably won't be... It will probably won't be farmers, but for example, when we're talking about Clive Palmer and he had shareholdings in the company, that was one of the reasons why they were looking to pursue him because he was financially benefiting from what had happened and then walking away. So the, there's, these, these provisions were drafted with Clive Palmer in mind, which is a little, a little odd from a drafting point of view. Um, it's not always the best way to craft the best definitions. Um, but anyway, we work with what we've got, don't we? So, oops, sorry guys, Let's see. Okay, so I deliberately didn't take a break because I knew I should hopefully be able to get through this a bit shorter than usual. Um, there were two handouts. There's one that talks about the structure of the Environmental Protection Act and there's another one for due diligence, both really important, so make sure you have a look. And um, and I will be available for um, consultation back in my office after this as well. So if you've got questions about the assignment, come and ask me.